This motion picture presentation is for your eyes only. So recently, for my HO scale model railroad, I've started making scale models of early NASA spacecraft as flat car loads. This started off as a, an experiment with the 3D print lab at Columbus College of Art and Design. I was an animation student there, but the engineering students had this fab lab downstairs in the basement of one of the buildings. And usually uh, before one of my classes, I'd have a few minutes where I could poke around down there and see what's going on. And uh, their 3D printing machines always really impressed me. And so I wanted to play around with them a little bit. And so I used them to 3D print a couple early spacecraft. Those being the Mercury, or the Mercury Redstone rocket, which carried Alan Shepard on his first 15 minute flight, first American in space. And then also the Gemini Titan II, which is a spacecraft that I've always thought looked quite cool. Now, the reason I 3D printed them is because I wanted to make them exactly to HO scale, because at least in the case of the Mercury Redstone, the real Redstone missile without the spacecraft attached to it is exactly 59 feet long. And some of my model railroad cars are 60 feet long and you see where this is going, right? Now that's not to say that all these were actually transported via a railroad car. In fact, the Titan II I know was almost exclusively hauled via truck. But it makes for an interesting flat car load on my model railroad and it's something very different. You know, in amongst a bunch of box cars and flat cars, it's kind of cool that, you know, hey look at that, one of them's carrying the, ta the fuel tank of a spaceship. Now the thing is, spacecraft get big exponentially, and an object of desire for the longest time in HO scale has been a Saturn V moon rocket. Uh, but unfortunately, if I was to actually build one of those in HO scale, it would get pretty big. It would be about four and a half foot tall, so from the floor it would come up to about here, and uh, be about yay wide, and uh, yeah, that's not quite happening. And uh, to demonstrate how big these craft get, here's a look at some of the previous models that I've built. So this is one of the smaller launch vehicles, but already compared to a person, it seems quite tall. Yep. Way up there. For some sense of scale though, this whole space vehicle is less than a five foot five in diameter. Uh, five, five, five was actually the height limit for flying these because if we hold up a person next to that uh, spacecraft, yeah, it's not much larger than the chair inside. There's really not a lot of room in there. And this is kind of the minimal space launch vehicle for getting a human up into a suborbital flight. The later missions of the uh, Mercury program, which include John Glenn's famous orbit around the Earth, used a much larger Atlas booster rocket. So we roll this one back out. The next one that I 3D printed, also to the same scale, and also to, as a flat car load for my various uh, HO railroad cars, is a Gemini Titan II. Uh, Gemini is pronounced correctly. That the um, Gemini is the Greek pronunciation, but this is a launch vehicle that was sent out from Florida and built in Texas, so the pronunciation is Gemini. Gemini uh, Cricket, if it were. So if we push this one out here, this one launches two people into orbit. And uh, as you can see here, we're starting to get a bit big. So this is twice the diameter. And this one is a two-stage launch vehicle. So that's the first stage. And on top of that is another stage. And way up there is the spacecraft itself, which carries two astronauts. Uh, they're kind of seated. It almost, it almost reminds me of a car, the way the uh, command module of this thing is built. It's kind of like gull wing doors. That's the amount of launch vehicle you need to get two people into orbit. But for an idea of how big, why a lot of these liquid fuel rockets, or just spacecraft in general, get so big as they lift heavier payloads, in order to get this thing into orbit, you need a, a launch vehicle that's not only able to carry the spacecraft itself, but also carry this second stage, because uh, otherwise you'd need a really big first stage if you were to use just that to get into orbit. The thing that kicked off this whole space race thing, the Soviet R-7, this was developed by 
Sergei Korolev, Ukrainian rocket engineer, who designed this and is still one of the main ways people get up to the space station now. There's your person for scale. And if we crane this way, way, way back. And uh, yeah, so this is the first version of it to carry a human into space. This is uh, Yuri Gagarin's spacecraft, uh, the Vostok 1. So with how big these uh, orbital spacecraft uh, are getting, uh, <laughs> the moon rocket, let's, uh, let's talk about the moon rocket. So Mercury spacecraft looks like this. And then the later Gemini capsule looks like this. And then the Apollo spacecraft, which carries uh, three people, looks something like this. So not only is the spacecraft itself a lot bigger on the Apollo missions compared to the earlier ones, because it's got to take three people on an eight day plus journey to the moon and back. And, you know, the uh, middle one, especially the Gemini, that little two seater, there's barely enough room for the people to move their arms around. So you know, the Apollo capsule had to be a fair bit bigger. Not only is it is that much heavier, but the Apollo command module is attached to a little booster engine of its own, and that's vital for getting it into and out of lunar orbit for the return journey. So not only does it have to move all that around, but because it's making an outbound flight towards the moon, the last stage has to be pretty big because it's pushing it out of Earth orbit. And so in addition to the 50 ton payload of the spacecraft and the lander and the people on board and all their stuff you're also having to lift the weight of the rocket that'll take it to the moon into earth, uh into an earth orbit and so because of that the bottom two stages are gigantic so as i've just shown you these model spacecraft tend to get big exponentially and as a result of that a lunar rocket like the saturn V, to scale with the rest of them would be enormous it wouldn't fit on a railroad flat car, it would probably be the tallest thing on the model railroad, and it would just be a bit impractical to build, and that's me saying that, and I have a Thunderbird 2 on my layout. Uh, so, I was looking around at various model spacecraft kits, and I found this, which piqued my interest. This is a model of a Saturn 1B, which was also part of the Apollo program. This spacecraft isn't quite as huge as the Saturn V, and its main mission was taking crews up into low Earth orbit on the Apollo command module. And it was the main vehicle to take astronauts up to Skylab. And uh, in the case of Skylab, the first ever mission to go visit Skylab was a uh, repair job, because uh, the Saturn V that launched Skylab, well, it, it simply put, they broke it. And... Uh, so this spacecraft's first job was actually sending up a crew of three, not just to live and work in the space station, but also to, uh, to fix the sun shield and uh, other things. But the important thing that was learned from there was how to make repairs on vehicles in space, is how to maintain a space station, and the knowledge gained from the Skylab program is why we now have the International Space Station as of the time of recording this video. In 2030, they're planning to deorbit the space station, it makes me feel things, uh, but hopefully in the future we'll have some cool new space stations. I know there's a few private ventures that are working on it, and you know, uh, I, this isn't a video about my opinions about the private space ventures. This is a video about building the SD's Saturn V, Saturn One B rocket kit, and we'll get into that. This is a new format for me. I've never actually filmed myself actually piecing something together. Usually I have lots of still pictures as I'm doing something. Uh, in case I mess it up badly and have to um, go back a few steps. Uh, but I've never actually filmed myself in the process of building something. And that's mostly because of the choice language that gets used, which I can edit out in this video. This is the first stage. Uh, I had to charge the battery on the camera and also uh, the, the alignment of these uh, eight tubes through here uh, needed a little bit of uh, finer precision than usual. But yeah, I got these tubes aligned. They poke through the uh, bottom of the first stage quite well. And the uh, next step is the uh, tube that connects the top two stages. 
unfortunately on this model you can't model the stages separated but in this case uh this the second stage is also pretty huge so i think it's pretty fair that they don't do that so that's the next tube that we're going to work with the instructions say to draw a line down the middle and uh this one here okay this one actually worked I'm gonna take a good size ruler and there's our line uh, starting from this line I'm kind of dreading this part because it's meant for spray adhesive and all I got's this and uh, okay uh, so with uh, these pointed down like that oh oh I see there's a little bit of excess that I've got to cut off Okay. So here it is again. We've got a lot of tape to clamp this thing down. I don't know if I trust the glue to hold this together, but it held that together pretty well. So we'll just kind of have to see once this dries. Work on something else. Sort of picking the super glue off my hands. Yeah, set that over there. So on top of the first stage would be the payload, which would, in this case, be the adapter module and the uh, command service module up, up top here, which uh, you get the more detailed one. They're exactly in scale with each other, which is kind of nice because I'm going to leave this unglued so that if I'm displaying this and I want to, I could feasibly just take the uh, engine off this and just stick it on top there. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, there's a cover here that goes over the top of the command module where it protects the windows and all that. Uh, I think that was originally done because they were concerned about the amount of uh, thrust that the Saturn V would generate, uh, potentially messing with the windows or damaging them in some way. Um, but from a modeling perspective, it means that this is going to be much easier to paint because uh, it's kind of just going to sit on there like that. If I grab this one, in theory, in, in on the real thing, uh, this would just kind of clunk like that just to protect the windows. It just slots in, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, this is just a friction fit. That's great. Oh yeah, this is the launch escape tower. So this is a little, oh yeah, yeah, just sticks right on there. Yeah. So the launch escape tower is one of those handy little safety features of this type of space vehicle. If we grab the uh, Mercury, the Mercury also has one of these. Uh, what it is is there's a cluster of little rocket engines at the top here. And if something goes wrong with the booster, say for some unforeseen reason, something really unfortunate happens with the booster, it maybe it explodes, fails to reach orbit or something. The escape tower has rocket motors at the top, which will pull the capsule, the spacecraft, away from the rest of the ship. And then the parachutes will come down and it'll land as normal. Uh, famously, the first time the Mercury Redstone was used, uh, it flew about four inches off the pad, uh, and then the guidance computer detected that some of the plugs had pulled out in the wrong order, so it thought that it had failed, and so it landed back on its tail, launched the escape tower, thinking that something had gone wrong, launched the parachute. And uh, in the case of modern spacecraft, they, uh, a lot of them have escape towers still that are kind of in different forms, like the um, SpaceX ones, they're actually built into the body of the spacecraft and then 
I think on the Soyuz it's the same kind of thing, but it's got more nozzles. And I think the the new Artemis spacecraft is going to have something kind of similar. But uh, yeah, it's a nice safety feature, and uh, from a modeling perspective, it's an extra thing that looks interesting. But uh, yeah, the. Uh, In theory, this part actually might not need any paint, maybe a little bit of weathering, but for the most part, it's, the real thing was white, which is to say that the spacecraft itself was aluminum, like that, uh, because on one of the later Apollo missions, they actually did try to paint the uh, spacecraft, the, the the crew portion of it, the this half, they actually did try to paint it white. I think it was 16 or 17. I can't remember which one off the top of my head, but anyways, uh, there's a beautiful bit of uh, film that they took where <laughs> they got it into orbit and they thought oh there's a lot of ice crystals breaking off and it turns out oh no that's the paint because aluminum heats and expands and contracts a lot it's very flexible and because in space one side is facing towards the sun and is being baked and then the other side is facing away from the sun in the shadow and it's freezing uh, the aluminum expands and contracts a lot and so the paint flaked off and uh, made kind of a cloud it looks decent. Which, that's another thing with uh, a lot of these earlier NASA missions pre-shuttle, is that they really only wanted short astronauts because the uh, proportions of the vehicle, especially these really early ones like the uh, Mercury and so on, uh, the actual diameter of this is 5 foot 5, and if you were any taller, you just couldn't fit in the spacecraft. And then Gemini was almost worse because you were shoulder to shoulder with the other person. A little, uh, yeah, so the escape tower had an interesting nickname. Uh, they called it the cue ball because if you imagine, if you imagine the whole spacecraft as a pool, uh, a pool rod, you know, the cue ball is the bit at the end that gets punted out, uh, and that's because very early in the launch they would jettison the uh, escape tower because at higher altitudes it wasn't needed. Oh, oh, I just realized, yeah, there's the little side thruster things. Is there actually a hole for these? Not really sure how these go together, but I'm kind of just... Ah, there we go. Yeah, I'm not really looking at the directions right now. I'm just kind of feeling what parts click. Oh. Oh, I see. There's a tube there. They're really conscious about saving weight on this one. Glue on the end of this didn't dry. Wow, look at that. That came out pretty nice. <laughs> I got an idea. So this is going to be upside down, but I'm just going to put this in there just to hold it, hold the shape of the tube while I do this. It's starting to come together, but uh, yeah, I need a little bit more glue right there. If I say a little, I, I really need to just absolutely lay it down. That's going to go through like that, and then we're going to have a, yeah. I wasn't recording for that last bit, but here we have it. <laughs> so I've got the wraps on this end all attached. This end, they're, they've been straightened out a little bit. Still a little bit of a thump there, but it's in line with the other one. So you know, as long as I'm not showing it from that side, we're good. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a thing, isn't it? It's later, and since last time, the first and second stages have been painted and primed in white. The rest of the spacecraft has been as well, uh, but right now we're just having it in white so that we can uh, do all the stripes. Now, the thing with the stripes is that they're different on each side. Uh, part of why they're 
the, they painted these white and had all the black stripes so they could tell what side of the vehicle was what when it was rotating and so on. And if we look at the chart here, it uh, looks something like that. And um, yeah, so it looks like the black stripes are fairly small. And as a result, I think I'm, I, what I might do is mask off the areas of this that are, or is, is spray this in black, mask off the areas that are supposed to be black, and then spray it again in white so that just the uh, these bits need masked off. And there she is. Gonna give this uh, coat of black a few minutes to dry, but it came out pretty good. And as I say, we're gonna mask this up so that just the uh, stripes are masked and then spray it in white one more time. And that'll give us the roll patterns on the spacecraft and then we can do decals and whatnot. And now we're gonna actually start masking it off. So as I say, the next coat of paint on this is gonna be white. The uh, spacecraft is mostly white. And if we look at the diagram, there's only very few stripes, so we're not gonna use very much masking tape. Um, the one part that looks like it's gonna be a pain is going to be down here at the, uh, you see how the, uh, yeah, I wish they'd shown me this picture before I put it, to, it, it re attached that, because, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to bother with that. Um, and uh, part of why I'm doing it in this order, too, is that uh, any overspray from the, uh, from the white is a lot easier to touch up, because I can just take a bit of black paint and throw it on there. Oh, yeah. Scoot the mic in a little bit more. There. Okay. So, first stripe is this one, which goes across the top. They say it's 15 sixteenths of an inch. I don't know how they come to that measurement. It's 24 millimeters, but 15 sixteenths of an inch, really? Part of, part of the thing with these model uh, rockets is that they fit onto a desk nicer than a lot of other models. Like, particularly with trains, they're, they, they're short in height and then very long, and layouts tend to get longer depending on how many cars you want to use. And uh, whereas this is a model that goes in the vertical direction, but takes up very little uh, surface space. So because of that, these I tend to put these on my desk. And so because of that, if I don't get this stripe straight, I'm going to be staring at it for the next however many years. And so the next stripe is 13 millimeters thick. I actually have some thinner masking tape I'm going to use for that. I'll be back in a moment. I'm knocking things over. Might actually have to do this bit off camera just because I'm wanting to get it nice and straight. How long do they have to be? Uh, they, don't, they don't. They don't say. They don't say how long this stripe is supposed to be, which. Two and one eighth inches. Okay. Oh, so here's a here's a here's a cool trip trick for cutting masking masking tape. What you do is you take your ruler, and do this, and then you get it nice and straight. <laughs> watch this, watch this. Then you take your scissors. Okay, so that piece of masking tape is supposed to be two inches long. That's what I've learned. It's a little crooked at the top, though, so... Okay. And, uh... That actually wasn't too bad. I think partly because I'm, I'm not even going to try to mask the... <laughs> Uh, eight-sided whole uh, I don't even know what you would call this 
thing at the bottom of the tanks, but I'm not I'm not putting a single piece of masking tape on it. I'm not even going to try. Uh, that and also the way I see it, um, looking at pictures of the Saturn One Bs, it was never the paint isn't actually super consistent between them uh, because I, my guess is that you know with each subsequent launch they made little design changes and the paint was important more in this case more for um, you know figuring out which side was which and where valves and important things were it was important for keeping the launch crews and the design crew design people and everybody on the same page as to where stuff was and so I guess as they made plumbing changes and whatnot uh, each subsequent one had slightly different paint and uh, this is the side that's going to be completely black uh, so included in the stripes so we're going to this is hurting my head too much too much geometry involved Okay. So There's a lot of geometry involved in this. This is what, one of the things that my sculptural class, because uh, really I'm building this as a sculpture. It's a, it's a representation of a thing. I mean, sure, it kind of is flyable, and I might fly it at some point, but really for the most part, this is going to be a uh, an object of visual, uh, yeah. Okay, so there's that. So the, the bit I was going to say is that the reason that we make models, just in general, is because we want to gain a better understanding of a thing. And that's something that comes across with sculptures is that really to under, you get a different understanding of a thing once you have gone, once you've gone through the process of trying to make it yourself. There's a uh, there's just something that something indescribable that happens where you are in the same position, your hands are doing the same motions, you're in the same uh, headspace as the person that originally made this thing, and for a brief moment it's almost like they're there with you. And in this case, um, you know, this is a model representation of the handiwork of many, many uh, NASA engineers, many of their mathematicians and st structural engineers and so on. And uh, in this case uh, of the Saturn 1B, some of the uh, designers that were over at Chrysler working on actually constructing this. And uh, and uh, in this case, you know, even just the, figuring out where all the stripes go, you know, I, I feel like I understand this this uh, Saturn one as an object much more than I did before. Which is to say that you know the history you can always look up and read, and I always find that interesting. But also, I don't know. There's just something about the physical the physical form that is in and of itself interesting which is why we have things in museums because on one hand yes the history is the historical significance is obviously the main reason but also just it's it's keeping a thing because it's interesting you know even if it didn't have even if it wasn't the last of its kind or a uh, historically significant thing you know it's just an interesting thing to look at too and that's kind of Something I noticed with, uh, you know, particularly with preservation of old vehicles and things, is that 
Yeah, sure. There's also you know, there's obviously there's the history, this historical component of it, but also they're just nice to look at. In in a way, there's because one of the other things in my sculpture classes we often talked about is that anything can kind of be a sculpture because what makes it a sculpture is the fact that we're being asked to look at it, which is why a, you know in a lot of art galleries there's kind of you know things that people might question, well, well, why is that a sculpture? And oftentimes things like that are put in art galleries specifically to make you sort of ask that question, you know, what makes it a sculpture or why am I looking at this thing? And the real reason that you're looking at it is because, well, somebody thought it was interesting and wanted you to look at it. You know, even if they didn't make it, even if it's just a thing that they found and they stuck in the gallery, you know, the the discussion part about it is, is why it's there. And in the case of something like a the Saturn One, for example, at a like the one at the Kennedy Space Center, the, actually well, the the one that I really should talk about is the one that was recently dismantled at the Alabama Welcome Center, and you know the reason it was there was both for historical reasons. You know the test stand for this was in Alabama, and you know, the one that was on display there was an actual, the first, uh, and the first Saturn One B built to actually have real rocket motors in it, and that's you know the historical component of it. But also, it's just an interesting looking thing, and it's it's worth you know appreciating, and you don't really get the same impression of it until, unless you're actually there able to look at it and uh that's that's the reason that we uh a lot of us well i, I in particular was well that's the reason I, why i was pretty upset when they uh had to tear it down recently because on one hand yeah the historical component of it is significant you know that it's a a real saturn 1b that was really used on a test stand and it was a vital part of the apollo program but also the thing itself you know that the, the reason that you know people were sad about its loss was wasn't necessarily so much that oh it's no longer uh, it's another piece of the Skylab history that's kind of been forgotten you know that's part of it but also the thing itself is gone and we we can no longer stand next to it and appreciate the sense of scale and you know, un we can no longer understand that particular Saturn 1B as it is, just as a thing. And I don't know, I think there's something kind of profoundly sad about that, especially because there is only one other, and um, that's at the Kennedy Space Center, but it's displayed differently. So it's, uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with them dis displaying it on its side, especially after the, the Huntsville one collapsed. Um, but because it's displayed differently, it... it we get a different feeling from it. And that's also why the um, the Shuttle Endeavor uh, at California Science Museum, that's why they've been putting so much uh, time and effort into mounting that upright on its display. Uh, not because it's, you know, not just because, you know, it's the only one that they can do that with because it has, they have a booster and, and, or the tank and the solid rocket boosters to do that, but also because it feels different from an audience, per the audience perspective of seeing it upright versus on its side. It it's telling a different part of the story, but it also just feels different as a sculptural thing. I hope any of that made sense, but uh, yeah, has been fully done up, and now we're ready to give it a coat of white and uh, see what happens. Next are ones that I've kind of dreaded doing throughout this process. They're the ones that say United States, and they go up and down these very thin tanks. Yee. Oh. Yeah. So the trick with this, this particular decal it's going on a very. It's going.
going on a curved surface. A very thin curved surface. It's got to go on nice and straight, otherwise it'll look weird and it'll bother me. Okay, so that's that's gone on okay. Got a bit of a bubble ru running through this side here. Ooh, okay. Eh, that's that'll do. That'll do. Oh, I don't know if any of that was shown on camera, but, uh, yeah, going to do the rest of these off camera because that gave me some gray hairs and, uh, shortened my life a little bit. Just bumped it against the ceiling. Okay. So, here we have the finished article. This is the Saturn 1B. And, uh, God, what a thing this is. So I might have mentioned it in my ramblings of building this, that to w there's a difference between looking at an object and knowing its history and knowing the significance of it, and then actually having a physical representation of it that you can look at. There's just a kind of something indescribable. You, you understand something more by not just handling it, but also trying to build it and understanding its construction. Uh, in the case of this model, I really didn't understand how the uh, the various tanks fit fit together or what the exact shape of it was. And I'm not sure what practical benefit it has understanding a, a form like this. You know, it's really more of a, uh, I guess, kind of a philosophical understanding of a thing. But I don't know. It, it's a different kind of understanding than knowing, you know, all the flights that it went on and its history and so on. And I don't know. I'm, I'm jolly pleased with this thing. And, uh, yeah. What a, what a little journey this, this took me on. The other thing, too, I find is that building scale models tends to be fairly relaxing. I mean, you, you might not have guessed it from the amount of uh, backtracking and... Um, uh, scratching of my head that I did during this process, but really I, I do enjoy building these kinds of models because, well, I don't know, you, you kind of forget daily real-world stresses for a little bit, and you just kind of sit with something, and what do you know, at the end of it you've got something that fits on a shelf nicely and you can talk about with folks later. Although in the case of this one, it'll be sitting on a launch pad for my NASA railroad model layout, it just barely fits, and the reason that I haven't put a back scene on the NASA Railroad module yet is because I needed to measure this thing and make it so that the sky backdrop covers the whole ship, because it would be kind of distracting if the sky backdrop cut off like here, and then it just kept going. Kind of like Doug Dimonome's hat or something. But, uh, yeah. Should make a cool model railroad, because, um, as I say, it's a pretty small module. Uh, the reason I can make it as small as it is, is because the loads that are being carried are tall, but not very wide. Uh, and also, I kind of figure that at a train show, you know, there's lots of people have logging layouts, lots of people have switching puzzles, which is understandable, they're cool. But I don't know, I think it'd be nice to have something a bit different. And, uh, yeah, hopefully this uh, module and this Saturn V uh, greet some of you folks at a train show one of these days. And, uh... Yeah, and also this is a flyable model, so I don't know, maybe if I felt like jeopardizing it, the whole thing, I could, you know, invest in some of those solid rocket motors and maybe 4th of July we'll see this thing take the skies to go off and rescue Skylab. Well, that's it for this video. I hope you folks have enjoyed it. I've got several uh, cartoons and animated things that you can click on somewhere around here. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can uh, do more of these. Bye for now.
something in the process of putting together this Saturn 1B model rocket, which is that, ooh, wee, ooh, I look just like Buddy Holly. Ooh, wee, ooh, and you are Mary Tyler Moore. I don't care what they say about us anyways. I don't care about that. God, what am I doing?